I'm very humble and, and happy to be here with uh, Joe and Stefano, that are my surgical colleagues, and uh, with Nikhil, that is uh, part of the gastroenterology team. And it's, uh, it's very nice because um, it's only by working together that you uh, offer the best to patients. And, and, and this goes together with what uh, we try to do in the lab. So I don't need to tell you that this is a patient with esophageal atresia. Mm -hmm and uh, they tried to pass the NG tube, uh, was not possible. And in the best scenario, and many of you have experimented that, so we can put the esophagus together. So well, that would be the best solution, but some of these children uh, either death fail or we cannot even try to do so. And there's various solutions that uh, we can use uh, to substitute the esophagus. Uh, but um, the one that we use at Great Almost Street by tradition, uh, introduced by Professor Spitzer, uh, is the gastric pull-up, uh, um, as you can see here, which is an excellent uh, solution for adults that have an esophageal cancer and then don't have, you know, 100 or 90 years in front of that uh, uh, to live. Uh, but for children that are born with these uh, esophageal atresia, it's certainly not the best solution, the one that we will uh, try to avoid hopefully in the future. So um, that's why many pediatric surgeons uh, have been working on trying to create a biological substitution. So what that means is uh, to create a piece of esophagus in the lab that can be used for patients. And uh, so in order to make an esophagus, you have to different structure that you have to use. You have to use a conduit, uh, you have to use a cell, and so on. So the first important thing is to understand how to build the different cells that are present in the esophagus. And I want to tell you a story that is just show how motivation sometimes is actually overcome knowledge. And it's about the collaboration of Alexis Carell that is, uh, was a Nobel Prize uh, because he described how to anastomose us to join together vessels. So he's considered the father of transplantation. When you transplant an organ, the first thing you have to do is to put together the vessels. Otherwise, that organ will not be vascularized. And so that's uh, what Alexis um, described. And Charles Lindeberg, maybe some of you have heard, was the um, first uh, engineer, the first man that did the um, flight over the Atlantic um, as solo flight. And uh, uh, so they got together for a strange reason that uh, Charles had a sister with a congenital cardiomyopathy. So she was about to die. So he went to Alexis and said, how is it possible that I can fly over the Atlantic and you cannot make a new heart for my sister? <laughs> As you can understand, this was in 1938. <laughs> so they start working together. And uh, um, actually, Charles learned how to do biology work. Uh, and they were able to culture cardiomyocytes from frog in a petri dish. So this was the first documented uh, cell culture uh, of the body. Now we know much more about uh, the cells that are present in our body and how they can renew so they can generate more cells and repair. So when we have an injury, uh, like for example, we injure our muscle, we know that with time this will gonna be repaired. It's because cells there are proliferating and creating new muscle fibers. So our muscle can repair. And good news uh, um, is uh, stem cells are present in any development stage. So of course the fertilized egg is these stem cells because it can generate an organism. Uh, but we have stem cells also in our self, uh, in our body. And to simplify things, uh, there are cells that are more potent, uh, uh, derived from the embryo, and there are cells that are less potent, they are present in our body. And these are the cells that are used, for example, for bone marrow transplant. Um, so if we want uh, to take an embryonic cells, and we wanted to make a new esophagus for a child, we'll be in the same situation as any transplantation. So we'll have to uh, immunosuppress the child that will receive that esophagus, which is not nice. So that's why this approach has only been used for one disease so far, because we, want, we don't want to have immunogenic problem or tumorogenic problem, and it's being used for macular degeneration. So when you have a problem in the retina, in the eye, nowadays there's about 100 patients all around the world that have been transplanted with embryonic stem cells. 
because in the retina our blood cells and our antibodies will not go there and so will not be able to reject the cells. <coughs> and so this is the only example where embryonic stem cells can be used. Sorry, on the other aspect we have the adult stem cells. They have been used for many years for the bone marrow transplant and so on. But this has been used also to replace tissues or small organs. The urethra, for example. So on, on trauma, or the posterior urethra, so on the uh, pelvic part, uh, cells have been taken and have been built new urethra to reconstitute the urethra. So these are five boys. They received the urethra. So at first, uh, they had a catheter put in the bladder from the abdominal cavity to drain the urine. But then they had this urethra implanted and they could uh, function with your new uh, urethra. The same has happened for vagina reconstruction. So this is in female uh, that are born without a vagina. It's called Rokitansky, it's a rare disease. And these are being implanted uh, with a tissue engineering vagina, taking cells from the patient itself. So of course, if you use a patient uh, patient cells, you don't have a problem of rejection of these cells and they are not so potent that you can generate a tumor. So I wanted to tell you the story of Kiran who received a similar transplant in 2010 at Great Homo Street Hospital. So Kiran was born with a congenital tracheostenosis, stenosis, so the windpipe have, was very tiny. And I received several operations to make it that larger. But I had a problem when he was uh, 12 in 2010. The stent eroded through the windpipe into the trachea and was bleeding. And so we had to do something different that some, uh, this video will show you. So a trachea was taken from a cadaver and washed out completely of the cells that you see there. And actually, it took about a month to prepare this trachea. Uh, now we are down to a couple of weeks uh, to prepare it. And this trachea was uh, completely taken away, all the cells present there. And that was stored in the fridge. <laughs> um, together with juice and, and all the rest. Uh, bone marrow cells were taken from the patient and also epithelial cells were taken. So to make a new trachea for this patient. Interesting. So the surgery was done then to remove uh, the old trachea. Uh, there was not any more, um, we were not able to use it anymore. And so the new trachea was prepared and we used some factors to tell the cells what to do in the trachea. I can assure you that the cells were put in in a not different way from what you see in the video here. <laughs> and so the neotrachia was ready to be transplanted in this way. So essentially what we have done with this child uh, was to substitute the old trachea uh, using this type of approach. Turn away if you don't want to see any surgical images, but just to show you the preparation and the implantation. So the trachea was implanted. At the beginning, we had some problem. We required the stenting of this trachea. But then the stent were removed and the trachea was uh, uh, functionally viable. But then with time, we learned that this trachea needed time to work. And about um, uh, six months, uh, we had epithelium growing. And about a year, really, the trachea was perfectly working. I could show you a lot of physiology study. I think the best physiology study is what I'm going to show you now. That is first that we could get cells from the trachea was actually working. The cells that we have in the trachea have a sort of a cilia, like a little finger to make the mucus coming out from our, our lung. And so in this trachea you see here, there are cilia with the fingers there on the top. And the other aspect is that uh, um, Kiram was not, that's the name of the child, was not able to walk really because he couldn't breathe. And you see here 
uh, playing the drum. Uh, very happily there. And uh, he never had a tracheostomy, and he never had the pill to suppress, so to immunosuppress him. So he received the cells and was happily taken. So, and credit of this work should give to all fellows that have been working on all these projects. I'm just uh, showing some of the names while I'm going on. Um, so, uh, taking from this, we have worked in different organs. I just want to show you a couple of examples. Here is an intestine that they completely wash out, but we preserve all the structure. So you see there, there are little um, places at the top of the intestine where the cells seed, and there's little holes at the base of the intestine. This is the normal structure of the intestine. We can add that also with human intestine, as you can see here, and all the structure still all maintained. So you see here a normal intestine, and here is without cells, but the structure is still maintained. So you think, oh, you're doing something amazing and you're very excited, and then you just go around the corner of the British Museum and you see that they were doing exactly the same thing <laughs> 20,000 years ago. <laughs> That's very depressing for the postdoc, I can tell you. Um, one thing that we did that was very interesting is that we want to get away from cadaveric organ, of course, uh, and we try to understand what these organs are all made uh, from. So one of the uh, most strange experiences I have ever done is to go with physics uh, in Grenoble at the accelerator. Essentially, you have electron coming out of this accelerator, and you can image this uh, type of structure and understand how they are made. Um, you can have a lot of information. I don't understand uh, numbers, but I understand uh, images. So you see here a piece of intestine that has been imaged using these techniques. So what they did then, they did a mathematical remodeling of this intestine, and they create an image of how the intestine should look like. And then we were able to use these images to do 3D printing. So as you can see here, I hope, you see here the intestine as the Mother Nature has done it, and here is the intestine as we have tried to do it. So you see the villi and you see crypt are not very different from this. It's very much still on the way, it's not ready, but it's, uh, it's we hope, the future. But what to do in the, uh, in the meantime, and that's what we are trying to do for the esophagus, <laughs> is that uh, a number of years ago, Jonathan and Luca in the lab have been working on trying to use um, cadaveric uh, tissue from animals rather than human. It's because we don't have enough, and we don't have it at the right time, particularly in children born with a small esophagus, uh, to use a human donor. And to make a long story short, they just uh, tested this hypothesis and they show that when you use a uh, matrix, a tissue coming from an animal, in which you strip out all the cells, you don't have any rejection. Because the scaffolding is so similar in different species that your body does not reject that. So the experiments that we are uh, now setting up uh, to do in, uh, in, uh, in patient, we hope uh, soon, uh, and I would like to credit uh, particular to Ed Annon and Federico Scottoni has done all the animal work uh, that is very important to these uh, experiments, is actually to take biopsy of children uh, born with esophageal atresia <coughs> and then seed it on pig esophagus uh, to transplant. I mean, it sounds a bit strange and freaking, but actually, pig's valves are commonly implanted, are commonly used. So it's not such a difference to what is normally done. It's just that by doing this, we'll have a functional uh, tissue. So we already established a bank of these esophages that we can uh, uh, prepare from pigs. Uh, and this is what we have already done. And then we used that. Uh, in all these, uh, um, in these bioreactors, and uh, I mean, Graham and some of the association have come down in London to see what we do in the lab, and we are happy to have people, if they want to see, if you want to see, you just contact us so through TOFs, uh, and then we can arrange for you to see what actually has been done in the lab and is currently uh, um, being done. 
So you see here a typical bioreactor, uh, the, uh, the way we call it. I'm not sure you are able to see here. But here is an esophagus that get the same stimuli that uh, should get in vivo. So it's, it's like moving uh, in the same way that you stimulate when you pass a bolus of food. So we are trying to stimulate those esophagus to make them ready to be implanted. We can follow them uh, without having to cut them. And we stimulate, we can see a very nice esophagus forming. So here you see a very tiny, thin esophagus that if we implant it, we break and becoming very thick after stimulation, so ready to be uh, transplanted. And then thanks to the collaboration with Dr. Tapar, we also use uh, neurocrest cells to implant in this esophagus to see if they can move uh, in the same way. So far, we haven't achieved that, but we see that they are integrating and actually they're responding to stimuli. So the cells are in connection, essentially. So they establish a connection between the muscle and the nerve that is important and is quite positive for the future. And then the inner layer is important. So we can culture again cells from the epithelium of the esophagus, expand them and then seed it. So here is just a seeded on a matrix and they lie very nicely and they can form different layers as they normally do also in the esophagus here. It's a bit dark but uh, this uh, in blue is just the skin of the esophagus forming inside the esophagus. So we implanted already in animals. Uh, here you see a little esophagus implanted and then uh, we could see that that retrieval we had a very nice structure of, of that happening. Not only all these dots that you see blue here are cells, but I want to sh finish by showing you an images of one of these esophagus in a rabbit uh, um, that we implanted. Here you see the windpipe in front, now we turn on the back and we start cutting with these CT scan images uh, the esophagus and you will see the structure they are present uh, uh, starting from the bottom uh, where you see the normal esophagus and here you see here the engineer esophagus that we implanted uh, which integrate very well with the esophagus on the rabbit. So are we ready for patient? No yet. Uh, we just had a, a further meeting with the amateur A that is the um, body that regulate this type of experiments in UK. They want us uh, to do specific experiments in the pig and will take about a year, I believe, uh, to be able then to transplant it in patient. So you see all this very complicated <coughs> and then uh, you can see that actually some of the experience out there is that maybe is, uh, we are able to make it much simpler. So uh, Mail Online, but actually it was published in The Lancet, uh, that they were able to restore continuity on esophagus in an adult using a patch, a patch that was made of a matrix and just platelet gel. So essentially from the blood of the patient and take it and this esophagus was restored using this type of approach. Again, this one example, uh, it's maybe that this will not be so easy, particularly in patients with esophageal atresia, but things are moving and are moving I think in the right direction. I just wanted to give you uh, some hope uh, that in the future will be able to have this available for patients. Uh, so um, stem cells can generate and can be useful for different tissues. Um, I believe, I strongly believe that they have a role in esophageal atresia. And I just wanted to show you that regenerative medicine actually is a clinical reality and may be possible also in esophageal atresia in the near future. I couldn't be here presented if it was not for all the collaborators working on this, uh, in particular Simon Eaton and Nikhil, you've just heard from him, uh, but all the um, uh, uh, people uh, working uh, in different centers of this project and my clinical colleagues that help us uh, moving towards uh, and uh, hopefully offering this uh, uh, potential to patient. Uh, a big thanks to TOFS. Uh, um, I, I got my NHR professorship in partnership with TOFS uh, and they were very, I mean, you were very uh, helpful uh, on getting the, that done and a big thanks to patient. Uh, without you, um, and here is Kiran with his mom, uh, we cannot move forward.